Well, welcome back, everyone. I hope each of you had an opportunity for a little nourishment and maybe even some rest. Uh, so before I get our afternoon, afternoon that is in the Americas uh, session started, uh, Roshi, anything that you would like to say beforehand? Let me get my mic. Thank you. So uh, we're moving from the uh, planetary and uh, extraplanetary dimension to the interpsychic dimension. I think it's very um, powerful that uh, Amy is going to be, of course, addressing um, uh, perspectives that uh, Francisco uh, developed, but also through her medium as a psychoanalyst and also looking at grief, which is something that um, whether we are conscious of it or not, uh, there is probably not one person on the planet uh, who has not been touched by a close loss. So I'm very grateful that uh, you're doing this. Uh, Amy, it's very congruent with the times. And um, as Noah mentioned at the beginning, none of this would be possible without um, the uh, beautiful contributions of Miracara, of the mindfulness uh, group in France, and also of this extraordinary faculty. And your donations are deeply appreciated. So thank you very, very much for your support. And uh, one final thing, deep thanks to uh, Gabor and Mind and Life Europe. Um, this collaboration has been characterized by a lot of joy. Thank you so much, Roshi. Well, as Roshi said, uh, Amy Cohn Varela is going to be leading us off in the afternoon uh, with her observations. And uh, just so none of you think we uh, have somehow uh, forgotten our schedule, uh, we're going to have, immediately following Amy's talk, uh, a brief break. Uh, we often need one a little bit earlier in the afternoon than in the morning. Uh, and then we're going to go right to John Dunn's talk. Uh, and John, I believe that's entitled, uh, Who Are You Going to Believe, Me or Your Lying Eyes? Maybe I got that wrong. Close enough, Al. Close enough. <laughs> Well, uh, <laughs> so um, by the way, uh, Al, I'm sure you know this. Um, hey, John, happy birthday. Oh, well, thank you. I'm just gonna, hey, John. I'm going to pop it as a surprise during my talk because I'm talking uh, at the time almost exactly when I was born. Well, this being called John Dunn was born 60 years ago, so. A dream indeed. In New York. Yes, a dream indeed. <laughs> a dream indeed. Mazel tov, that's uh, Sanskrit, as you know. Sorry, I had my audio the wrong way. Is that better, Noah? That's good, yes. Sorry, okay, sorry about that. All right, and then after John's talk, uh, Roshi Joan is going to be uh, uh, our discussant and facilitating a, a discussion, which will open up to both Amy's presentations as well as John's. So we'll have an opportunity to bring in a lot of threads then. So Amy, the floor is yours. Thank you, Al. Thank you. And thank you, Roshi, for the beautiful introduction. And we at Mind and Life are very, very grateful and happy to be sharing this stage with you and hope that uh, it's the beginning. Um, or a new beginning since it's been a while. <laughs> so I, um, as, as Adam mentioned um, early in his talk, I, I would like to also dedicate my thoughts, the thoughts that I'll be presenting you today to William Irwin Thompson, to Bill, Evan Thompson's father, whose sweeping intellect and poetic tongue enlivened my imagination over really over several decades and whose friendship with Francisco Varela provided Francisco with a home, 
um, a real intellectual and spiritual home in which he could expand and deploy his mind apart from the disciplinary divisions of the scientific academy. To say that Bill was a cultural historian is too limiting to describe a mind that was expert in transgression, fluid connectivity incarnate, and that detected visionary bridges between phenomena that were conventionally distant, but mythically close. Bill was a man of myth and the truths that myth bears and not of convention. He brought people he brought people together from wildly disparate domains whose work he intuited might have invisible points of connection that would emerge with the alchemy of the encounters. Intellectual domains, he said, must cross breed. One cannot bring forth this planetary horizon alone, he advises us. It takes a kind of mind jazz of different intellectual domains, different ways of knowing, to bring forth the invisible meta domain that is a world. Bill made the Lindisfarne conversations a cosmopolitan sanctuary where his guests could be, and through this conviviality, become more themselves and more than themselves. This virtual improvisational meta domain evoked by mind jazz is a, as good a metaphor for emergence in complex systems as I can possibly imagine. When he birthed the Lindisfarne Association in 1972 for the study and realization of a new planetary culture, he dreamed up a countercultural living room for his friends. He took them in and nourished them with hospitality in the very deepest sense of the word, that of a host who embraces the guest with cherishing and respect for their otherness. This is taking friendship seriously. And Bill elevated it to the status of a political concept, even if he eschewed politics as a basis for culture. Bill kindled so many imaginations with his poetic and intricately wrought evocations of the possibilities of a planetary culture, one that goes beyond interdisciplinarity to the fusion of horizons of art, science, and spirituality. He was an undaunted explorer of edges, he was convinced of the power of the imagination to metamorphose our ideas about the domains we work in and sometimes get trapped in. The imagination, Bill writes, is a transformer, the living membrane between the known and the unknown. Only an aficionado of autopoiesis and James Joyce could have come up with this metaphor. So I thank Bill, wherever he is, for leaving us with all this to think with and to live with. So today I'm not going to give you a formal presentation, one that goes from A to Z with a tight line of argumentation or explanation. Um, I decided given our theme and given the times we are in to experiment a little bit with uncertainty and try to put together some concepts from Francisco Varela's thought on the nature of life and living systems in terms of how they apply to an experience that most of us know intimately and that I enter into relationship with whenever I work with a patient in analytic therapy. This is the experience of grieving. Grieving too often is thought of as being a private experience in our first world Western societies. One curtailed by antidepressants or reduced to the question of how many days you get off work when you lose someone. The traditional rituals accompanying it are diminished or excluded. Mourning is generally considered to conclude when the lost object is replaced by another one. But grieving, as we all somehow sense, is far more than that. It is a thoroughly relational process. It mobilizes in dialogue the self and the other who is absent. Grief calls on the psyche to go beyond its identity as it is configured in connection with the other by internalizing traces of what has been lost, lodging otherness at the very heart of the self. This necessary internalization of grief makes it a fully fledged process of development, similar to the ones we undergo in childhood and at different stages in life. By welcoming the absent other in this new way, grieving presents an opportunity for affirmation and the expansion of the self. Now, in order to understand grieving in a relational sense, 
I'll begin by evoking some of the concepts we need in order to understand Francisco's organism-centered perspective of life. Organism-centered as opposed to what, you might ask. Francisco and the lineage he belonged to as a biologist, uh, Evan mentioned Bateson this morning, there are others, um, put, the, put the living being first in developing his theories of how it lives and interacts with its world. One of his favorite quotes was from the philosopher Hans Jonas, who said, only life can know life. This means developing an understanding from the inside, as it were, and not having recourse to conceptions of life that model it on the machine, a tendency that is a long scientific and philosophical history, and that we can hear today, for example, in the way we speak of our minds as computers processing information. If we are machines, who constructs these machines? Genes, you might answer me, with their programs, messages, and codes. But here again, the machine-like or computational metaphor is at work. If you think genes hold the secret of life, then the object of biological study becomes not life, but biochemical processes. This critique of the gene-centered view of life was developed by biologists like Francisco, along with many others. The central and I find substantially consequential and even urgent motivation for this shift in perspective is to breathe life back into biology. To quote the title of our good friend, the brilliant biologist, John Stewart's last book. Our survival together on a healthy planet may depend on us making this shift. What actually is it to view life from the inside? It is simply what we all do when we engage in scientific endeavors or any other kind of endeavor, since we are ourselves are living conscious beings bent on decrypting ourselves and our worlds. But our perspective as embodied beings fully implicated in our work is almost always masked by the illusion of distance cultivated by an objective stance. As Bruno Latour says, we've gotten so used to the view from that far off dog star named Sirius, whose name whimsically echoes the Sirius of Sirius science. We're so used to observing from a distance that we no longer even know how to describe the very world we are embedded in. Francisco's task was to make explicit our living implication in how we understand life. He and his colleagues built a theory of the living built on observations of the phenomena of life and of how we engage with the world. He didn't conceive of the world as a reservoir of information out there that we must process with our brains as if we were computer-like machines, but rather as a space in which living beings engage in an ongoing process of creation of meaning. One of his favorite metaphors for this engagement was that of a dance between the sentient being and world. The rhythm and steps of this dance compose what he along with Evan Thompson called the inactive approach to life and cognition. The inactive approach or embodied knowing is different from objective knowledge. It is relational, it emerges from connections. It is also dynamical and because of that nature, never frozen, never fully secured. It is flexible, adaptable and uncertain and being never certain, fragile. Because of that fragility, embodied knowing is precarious but that unsettled nature makes it boundlessly creative. I won't go further into the detail of inaction as an alternative to machine-like views of life and of knowing life. We have here several people at the symposium whose work inspires itself from this organism-centered perspective and who have a vastly deeper and more ramified understanding of it than I do. As well, each one of these people has taken it up and developed this thinking in very singular ways and expanded it in creative ways far beyond where Francisco unfortunately had to leave off. Instead, I'd like to give you a simple and partial sketch of my understanding of the notion of the self identity or the I from the perspective of Francisco's thought, then an evocation of what he means when he speaks about the sense-making relationship that Evan brought up this morning already. The sense-making relationship that characterizes the relationship of sentient beings to their world. And finally, I'd like to connect this with some thoughts about the process of grieving and how it puts into play who we are and who we are together in our relations with ourselves, with the dead and with the living. 
But first, how does the organism constitute an identity for itself? And how does this identity give rise to a world for that organism? Francisco's answer to this starts with a circle that he called the golden egg, the very biologic, the logic of the living. This golden egg he identified as the circularity proper to natural or social systems. This circularity helps to understand the autonomous nature of natural systems, how they maintain their self-regulating or organization. Autonomy in this context means self-law, self-rule. This usage of the word autonomy differs from the way we use it in everyday speech, where autonomy implies a kind of individuation that cleanly separates the monadic autonomous self from any outside influence or determination. An autonomous person, as the term is generally used, is one who is self-contained and independent. On the other hand, the autonomy perspective on natural beings refers to a system whose processes are related as a network so that they circularly, we also say they recursively, Adam mentioned this also this morning, depend on each other to produce and maintain themselves. Think of the cell that produces and maintains its own components, including its membrane. The dynamics of these processes constitute the system as a unity. This wholeness or individuality or identity of biological beings is brought forth by the system itself with no need for an external creator or internal mastermind or program to oversee it. And living systems have the capacity to maintain their identities in spite of and along with fluctuations and perturbations coming from without. Living thus or going on being is a process, one of asserting an identity from within. The circular processes of self-production are ensured because the system is contained. It has what is called organizational closure. That came up with Adam as well this morning. This particular kind of closure is not a sealing off that precludes interchange between system and environment. An organism in total isolation would die from the lack of resources to continue its processes. An organism without adequate closure would dissolve into its environment. On the contrary, you might think about closure not as a barrier, but as an edge, a boundary, but a boundary that is porous and active and intimately binds the organism to its surroundings while at the same time distinguishing it from them. Referring to the nature of the autonomous organism, Francisco uses a variety of terms, identity, self, cognitive self, selfless self, virtual interface. Looking more closely at the nature of the self in this framework, we see it as an emergent property of a distributed network of processes. Francisco continuously stressed the transience or impermanence of this biological self as an emergent property. With these somewhat enigmatic terms, selfless self, virtual interface, he tried to render the concept of an identity that is the result of dynamical processes that are constantly changing. It is thus an identity that has no fixed ground. These terms also try to convey the notion that the self is an appearance that seems to point to a central and stable entity residing in the being, but that in fact does not exist as such. Yet there is nonetheless an appearance or feeling of existence, an impression of durable identity. Translating up from the level of the organism to the level of the whole person, Francisco calls this our illusion of a center. The constitution of an identity which is inseparable from the constitution of a world we call sense-making. Evan brought this up this morning. This bringing forth of a world of salient objects for a being is the inherent creativity of the living that cannot be reproduced by machines. As soon as there appears a self, there appears a perspective, a point of view corresponding to that self that is a world for that self. What surrounds it is not neutral, it is charged. The organism-centered perspective infuses the world with meaning and function of the needs the organism must fulfill in order to survive and to flourish. Relationship then, is at the very heart of both the autonomy of living systems and of their way of engendering meaningful worlds. We are creatures composed of bonds. We are constituted by them through and through.
In this framework, there is no life without autonomy and no autonomy without dependency on a relationship to that which is not me. Francisco calls this the intriguing paradoxical, uh, the intriguing paradoxicality proper to an autonomous identity. The self must distinguish or affirm itself as an entity and at the very same time remain tied to its environment. It needs to do both in order to survive. The philosopher Hans Jonas calls this paradox of autonomy and dependency needful freedom. It is, one might say, the existential condition of the organism, precariously poised on the crest of this paradox of synchronous dependency and independence between being and non-being. What is striking to me here, both in Francisco's developments on the transient identity forming dynamics of the living and its sense making through dialogue with the surrounding world is the introduction of the dim dimensions of loss and death, of the imminence of non-being and death at the heart of the process of life itself. Breathing life back into the biological system in turn breathes into the very heart of the living, the negative of life, its shadow side. In describing the circularity of autonomous systems, Francisco often used the image of the Ouroboros, the snake who eats its own tail, representing eternal renewal through the cycle of life, death, and rebirth. As far as I know, he did not venture to explicitly develop the theme of death in his work, except in an essay describing his experience of an organ transplant that he underwent two years before he died. Nonetheless, it seems to me that his work is permeated with a sensitivity to the negative of life arising together with his descriptions of its affirmative side. The transient mode of appearing of identity and the ongoing need to affirm life through sense-making situate the self in a realm of uncertainty and precariousness. This inevitably brings to mind the vulnerability and loss as the heart of our life and at, at, at every step of our development. And that is perhaps those vulnerabil that vulnerability and that loss, the very motor for full affirmation of life. So for reasons that I haven't fully fathomed when I started to think about what I might write for, for, for uh, this symposium, um, and what I could write that would connect sense making and grieving, a memory kept popping into my mind and it stayed there as if it really wanted to be written or said. Here it is. A few months after we met, Francisco invited me to a cocktail party after a meeting of scientists and philosophers at the Ecole Polytechnique. This was where he worked with a group on modeling complex systems and the epistemology of cognitive science. The Ecole Polytechnique is a sort of French version of MIT, a stately set of formal 18th century stone buildings atop the Montagne Sainte Geneviève in the Latin Quarter of Paris. After the party, we took a crepuscular walk down to the Jardin de Luxembourg, where the feral growth and flamboyant colors of spring blossom seemed to mock the prim intentions of the highly curated flower beds French gardeners are so fond of. As we sat talking on a bench, a breeze came up, sweeping the sand on the walking path into the air. A bit of grit infiltrated my eye. And as I started to tear up and rub at it with my fingers, Francisco said, hold on, took my head between his hands and leaned down. With a swipe of his tongue, he licked my eye, wiping the grit away. Later, I learned that this is a well-known technique for removing irritating particles from eyes. But at that startling moment of animal intimacy, I feel undone. I'm not sure how to interpret the story, nor, nor do I know why it's so insistent and stays with me like this and kept on popping in and out when I was working on this. One interpretation is that unlike so many memories you have, it retains a strong sensual impression. When I recall the moment, I feel the being undone all over again, as if something irreversible happened at that moment. But what? And my only access to it is through sensation. It is non-discursive. It occurred to me thinking about it that perhaps the only discursive form that might capture this event might be a haiku. 
A relationship with another is a golden egg. It partakes in the circular dynamics characteristic of all life. Sharing life with a person or other people is altering. It molds and shapes us over time, most often in very subtle ways. During our interactions and exchanges, we rub off on one another. We create a shared space, an in-between, one that is neither mine nor yours. Psychotherapists call this in-between space the transference, a transitional space for experiencing. For experiencing, for playing, for experimenting, where the inner realities of the participants and the shared realities of life all take part. This is a non-linear field where words and their chains of associations, other words, more words, circulate. Each word enfolds countless chains of others, and each word of each chain engenders others still. In addition to the linguistic circulation, bodily indicators of engagement, gestures, muscle and visceral activity constitute the felt quality of this transitional in-between, entre-deux opening. This is not a Cartesian type space. Psychoanalyst Michel Montrelet imagines it as a liquid. Any story you immerse in it, she says, for example, an account of a dream, however linear it may be, breaks apart into bits and multiplies so that each of its elements is at the same time here and everywhere else. This is the space of relationship, a dense manifold of bonds and associations. We engage with one another through this web and the capacity we have for engagement with others is what Francisco called sense-making, the embodied know-how of everyday life. Hannah de Yeager's work, which are, we are lucky to be hearing about tomorrow, builds on sense-making to develop further her idea of knowing in connection or engaged knowing a knowing that is not attributable to a single individual, it starts in connection. It starts with, from within the bond. Hannah calls it our most sophisticated form of human knowing, and I thank her for that term. It's extremely difficult to describe the kind of knowing that takes place from within the framework of connection, of relationship. I'm all too familiar with this difficulty through years of efforts to give accounts of my work as a psychoanalyst. The psychoanalytic and more generally psychotherapeutic experience resists linearization. Although filled with words, it resists narrative accounts. This problem can be remedied by referring to a fragment of work with a particular patient as an illustration of a larger theoretical or diagnostic discussion. But as soon as you do this, you realize that you've lost most of the process by reducing it to its lineaments, its properties, thereby objectifying what was a richly layered and mobile experience. What escapes this kind of account are the lively dynamics that go on within and underneath the linguistic register. The data is there, but the experience is drained out. It becomes a mere residue. Of course, even while it is happening, the experiential dimension can be eliminated. eliminated. This occurs when the analyst holds theoretical frames in mind and superimposes them onto an ongoing interaction. Doing this, she extracts herself from the connection, theorizing she's no longer listening and must ask herself what in the patient's words compelled her to stop listening. Having had training in literary studies and specifically in textual analysis, as a beginner therapist, I, tries, I tried to use techniques from hermeneutics to guide my listening. For many years, I would sit with my supervisors and close read the sessions I'd had that week. While the words remembered and noted were a rich source of understanding and working with them allowed me to see connections that could only be decoded retroactively, there was always something missing from these accounts. The experience was reduced out. The only thing that came to seems to come close to rend rendering it is when I elaborate in dialogue a memory of a bit of a session, a fragment. On the patient side of this relationship, something similar takes place. Much of the experiential aspect of the work is forgotten, absorbed into the unconscious. Often during the course of an analysis or as it is ending, the patient will talk about this forgetting as if it re represents some kind of a failure of the process 
whereas it is more likely the sign of a successful integration of the work. For both analyst and patient, there does con consciously remain some sense of the feeling of connection of that relationship. This is roughly similar to childhood memories. You may remember an event, but you never can remember it as it was as you were at the time you were experiencing it. That past version of yourself who experienced it is irretrievably lost. What is, what is left is perhaps a visual memory with a vague, difficult to define feeling attached. The fluctuations of remembering and forgetting carry in, carry in them an irreversibility. We move forward being done and undone all over and over again. These dynamics may be an uncanny relative to Francisco's virtual self, its psychological or experiential face. Reflecting on this difficulty, I thought of another situation that contrasts this knowing in connection from distance, linear, or objective understandings. As many of you know, Mind and Life Europe is celebrating two anniversaries this year, the 30th of the publication of The Embodied Mind authored by Francisco Evan Thompson and Eleanor Roche, and the 20th anniversary of Francisco's passing. We've organized a number of different kinds of events to celebrate these anniversaries, and the invitation here by, from Roshi and Upaya is one of them. So for the last months, I found myself deep in a bath of evocations and discussions about Francisco's work, both as a speaker and as a listener. As I listen, I'm reminded of something that I rarely think about spontaneously anymore. I'm reminded of the number of things I did not ask Francisco, Francisco about when he was there, present next to me and capable of answering. The number of questions I didn't ask him about himself, his past, his impressions of this or that, aspects of his work and thoughts. There's a simple way to explain this. The presence of the other obviates the need for this level of explicit discussion. Of course, we do talk to our partners and companions all the time, but what shows up when they're gone? What shows up in their absence? What shows up when we've lost them? Are the unasked questions, the conversations we never had, the unknown that is now unknowable. Grieving people very often think and say, I wish I'd asked my dad about his college years or if I only I'd recorded mom talking about her life. Now it's too late. The musician and poet Laurie Anderson says, when my father died, it was as if a whole library had been burned down. Listening to scientists and scholars develop Francisco's work, I feel joyful. I also take note of how Francisco has shifted and multiplied, refracted through the many who knew him or study his work. I feel a part of me hard at work in the gap, in the entre deux, in the écart, between all the thoughts I'm hearing about him and his work and what I lived but no longer can recover. He's receding. It feels like an oscillatory process. Through my reading of his work or listening to others' readings, I am reconstructing a new image of him that sends me back searching for the lived feeling of his presence. When that proves elusive, I return to the image. There are nonetheless salient moments when I or another person grasps and expresses something about him or his way of thinking, and that feeling of being in connection suddenly materializes. It comes usually as a bodily sensation rather than a thought. Then, as I try to seize onto it, it's as if my mind gets snagged by the attempt, like when your shirt catches on a nail, leaving behind a little tear, a rent in the cloth. Behind or below this tear may be the space I'm ineluctably forgetting. Somehow what Francisco calls the organism-centered perspective escapes memory. I'm no longer the same person as she who experienced it. In the gap between the lived knowing in connection and the community of scholars who recall him with their words, I undergo a process of transformation that mostly is happening unbeknownst to me, but that is brought to my awareness when I dwell there. These memories remind me of what I no longer know, the lived experience of our life together. 
but the one who has forgotten it is transforming into a different kind of knower. There are many theories about grief and the grieving process. Most of the more accessible theories are organized around the idea that it is a process that progresses through the accomplishment of a variety of stages or tasks. The literature is voluminous, but what most of it has in common, even works that define it as a more or less linear process is the idea that each experience is singular, unique to the individual experience, the individual who's experiencing it. Because the work of mourning calls on the specific history of modes of relating to the world of the individual as they have evolved over her development. So rather than look at the theories, I'm going to try to briefly evoke an aspect of what happens when we feel we are grieving for a person we have lost. So you're sitting in a cafe or cruising the aisles of a supermarket and you catch a glimpse of the side of a head that exhibits a certain pattern of baldness. Or you're in the street and ahead of you walks a woman with a particular swaying sort of gait. At a party, you hear a peal of laughter with an unusual sonority. Showing you a picture he has drawn, you feel yourself captivated by the sight of your son's hands and the shape of his fingernails. Your awareness of your loss may have faded into the background for a moment. All of these are the kinds of small events that can trigger a renewed conscious awareness of that loss. Grieving proceeds by detail, by fragment. A perception, even the smallest detail, triggers a wave in the mind upon which swells an image of your loss, accompanied by the bodily sensations of absence. These triggering details or fragments do not necessarily really resemble the traits of the one you lost. Often that pattern of baldness or that gait upon a second look in no way resembles a feature of the person you are mourning. But these details bring a sense of realism into the experience, making it feel concrete and making the loss feel real. This fragmentary aspect of the work of mourning has a certain resemblance to the economy of desire itself. The objects of our de desire, which we usually articulate as needs, are like a chain of fragments. In psychoanalytic terms, we'd call them partial objects. When we succeed in acquiring one of these and feel satisfied, desire inevitably swells up again and it's time to move on to the next thing. From one perspective, moving from, one, from object to object is not such a bad thing as it keeps us feeling alive. As it is with desire, so it is with mourning. It appears as an oscillating pro process. Consciousness of loss is triggered by a forgetting of it. Detail by detail, the loss is re-experienced and then in time subsides once again into forgetting. This alternation between remembering and forgetting is a kind of practice of loss by repeating the felt experience of it in miniature, as it were. There's another important slant to this work or practice of mourning. That is the loss of our self in grief. What does it mean to lose yourself in grief? The loss we practice when we mourn is the loss of who I was when the other was present. The loss of myself, my I in connection with the other. When patients come to analysis after a loss or experience one during their analysis, this loss of self in connection may be expressed with as much pain as the loss of the loved one himself. Often it comes in the form of aggression or anger at being abandoned or a fear or guilt that as I grieve, I'm abandoning the person I've lost. Letting go of the other means recognizing that I'm changing. It takes me a step away from myself in connection with the other. In other words, it is a loss of the self as you knew it with all the fear of dissolution that that entails. Grief cannot be mastered there's no way of telling in advance where it will take you. You will be done and undone over and over again. The process of mourning is thus at least double. It entails practicing the felt loss of the other and the felt loss of the self, a circle of doing and undoing. The work that must be done then is that of coming to the realization that forgetting is not abandoning and that the loss of the former self in connection with the other is part of a circular process of renewal. 
the transformation that comes with the loss of self and connection is one of welcoming into the self traces of both the other and the who you were, the I of that relationship that is now one-sided. And so as I submit myself to the force of grief, and it is a force, lost bonds to the other come to live within me. And this otherness within me becomes a site of dependency that is not a source of weakness, but rather one of power because of the increase of inner complexity it affords. This capacity to integrate and accept internal otherness through grieving prefigures our ability to accept and welcome otherness when it arrives from the world. This welcoming must embrace the other in its radical otherness without compromise. Grieving has something to teach us about welcoming practices that we will all need to elaborate and enact for the quality of life we will share in the future. If we are to respond to the critical events of today and the future, like pandemics, like climate migration, the challenges the cha that challenge and transform our previous conceptions of statehood, neighborhood, and conviviality, we will need to elevate notions like welcoming, like friendship, like hospitality, and give them the status of concepts that we can put to work for us. It is not a given to receive the other, dead or living, and that reception is never complete, but rather a practice to be cultivated season after season. Thank you. Amy, thank you so much. Um, I, uh, I know we're uh, moving into a break, but I also would like to share sc my screen. But someone has to uh, enable that. Noah, can you uh, enable screen sharing? Yeah, so. hold on a second. I think, uh, yeah, let me just reclaim host. And then if Gustavo hasn't done it, uh, oh, wait, let's see. Okay, now ahead. <laughs> I think I took that photograph. Uh-huh. I, I think you very well might have. <laughs> oh. Oh, Amy, thank you. What an extraordinary perspective on grief. And um, I know we're, we are having our, our break now. I, I just, um, I think all of us who knew uh, Francisco directly uh, are grateful for this opportunity to be with each other in this way, because part of that love now is expressed in the maturation of the experience of grief that um, you know so intimately, and I know Ev and Richie, I and others, and Gabo, who's on with us today, Leslie. Um, our lives, in a way, have been enriched by interjecting or inviting Francisco uh, into our subjectivity as a constant and as an ancestor. Love you so much. Thank you, so Roshi. By the way, the the um, the picture that uh, I shared at the beginning, which Amy asked me to share, in case you didn't catch it, is uh, Francisco Varela, Erwin Thompson, and guess who's on the right? Francisco, Bill, and Ev. Yeah. So. Exactly. Uh, how old is Evan there? Evan, how old are you? Uh, that. Uh, we're Ninety-seven. Being... 97? Yeah, 97, 96 in Minerbe on the, the back there. So I would have been uh, early 30s. I took that one. Yeah, I remember. <laughs> <laughs> How sweet. Beautiful boy. Well, Amy, thank you so much for both an extraordinarily insightful and very heart penetrating talk. I'm very grateful. Thank you very much, Al. So we're going to have a 15 minute break. We'll reconvene at the top of the hour for John's talk. So please do what refreshes and be back. So we'll be able to 
hear what John has to offer. 